For at least 200 years, those with the vision of the anointed have been claiming that criminals have been misunderstood by the public and mistreated by the law. A product of social circumstances and societal failures, criminals should not be punished but rehabilitated. According to this view, found in such 18th century figures as Condorcet and Godwin. In addition to questioning the morality of punishing people for circumstances beyond their control, the anointed tend to believe that punishment does not work, but that rehabilitation does. This belief is part of a wider pattern among the anointed of emphasizing dispositions rather than incentives, whether discussing criminals, international diplomacy, or child rearing. The conclusions of those with this vision are as logical as the opposite conclusions of those with the tragic vision. It is the imperviousness of the anointed to any argument or evidence, and their readiness to dismiss and condemn those with different views, which have made criminals mascots symbolizing the superiority of the anointed. An episode in San Jose, California illustrates this mindset. The federally funded Alternatives to Incarceration program sent selected imprisoned criminals to colleges to complete their sentences there instead of behind bars. After a series of rapes at San Jose State University, the city's police chief discovered that imprisoned rapists had been released to that institution and that convicted felons routinely stalked women in dark streets in the vicinity of the university in downtown San Jose. What is revealing is the response when he expressed his concern to the director of this particular project. When I complained, the project director said the clients were screened and that California had declared it an exemplary program. Actually, we later found out that the program screened applicants only on the basis of academic scores. Federal rules prevented consideration of their criminal records, and California had declared the program exemplary only because it submitted quarterly reports on time. When my complaints about the program became public, I was censured by the students and faculty and advised by my superiors in City Hall to go easy. After all, this was an exemplary, federally funded program to reduce recidivism. Note that it was not considered sufficient for the anointed to disagree with the police chief's assessment of the danger. It was necessary to condemn him for expressing such concerns. Moreover, the intentions of the program to reduce recidivism were considered weighty in themselves. Then, a few months later, came the tragic denouement when the police arrested an honor student in the program for brutally torturing, raping, and murdering two women near the university. He was articulate, and the project had often used him to show how wonderful it was that bright people could get a college education instead of languishing in prison. Nor was this an isolated failure. During the entire decade of this program, not one client actually graduated from the university, but a number were arrested for crimes against women. The point here is not simply that some people were mistaken in their beliefs and hopes for this particular program, but that they barricaded themselves against all beliefs to the contrary and morally condemned those who expressed such beliefs. It is this pattern which has been all too characteristic of the anointed, on this and other issues over a very long span of time. Moreover, such patterns can be found among the anointed from the local level to the Supreme Court of the United States. Most of the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark decisions expanding or creating rights for criminals occurred during the 1960s, but another landmark decision of national importance originated earlier in the Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, a court aptly characterized as having a more liberal-than-thou posture that made it the darling of the Washington Post. This was Judge David L. Bazelon's 1954 decision, expanding the insanity defense in criminal law, an expansion which reverberated far beyond the legal jurisdiction of this particular court, becoming by imitation in other jurisdictions the law of the land. It was thus not simply the view of one judge or of one court, it was an expression of the vision of the anointed. Before Judge Bazelon's decision, American courts tended to follow the same legal principle used in British law in the 19th century McNaughton case. The jurors ought to be told in all cases that every man is to be presumed to be sane and to possess a sufficient degree of reason to be responsible for his crimes until the contrary be proved to their satisfaction and that to establish a defense on the ground of insanity it must be clearly proved that at the time of the committing of the act the party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from disease of the mind as not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing or if he did know it 
that he did not know he was doing what was wrong. This was not good enough for Chief Judge Bazelon. In the Durham decision of 1954, he repudiated the McNaughton test by shifting the burden of proof to the prosecution when the defense claimed that the defendant was not guilty by reason of insanity and by allowing much more expansive psychiatric speculations to be introduced as evidence in the trial. In his decision in the Durham case, overturning the burglary conviction of a man with a long history of crimes, including writing bad checks, which hardly suggests a lack of reasoning ability, Judge Bazelon spoke of the science of psychiatry and the science of psychology as reasons for letting speculations from these fields deflect the criminal punishments that would otherwise fall on the defendant. No longer did the defendant have to be insane. It was enough if there was some evidence that the accused suffered from a diseased or defective mental condition. The nebulous notion of defective mental condition evolved in later cases into saying that someone suffering from an abnormal condition of the mind was not responsible for his crime. To follow this logic, the more horrible the crime, the further the criminal departed from civilized norms, and by definition, the more abnormal his mental condition. By such reasoning, every violation of law should be excused. But, of course, nothing as straightforward as this was proposed. Instead, the speculations of psychiatrists and psychologists were to be accepted as science, and criminals acquitted whenever these scientists raised sufficient doubts in the minds of jurors. It was not necessary to convince the jury that the defendant was insane or even had an abnormal mental condition because the burden of proof was on the prosecution and insanity was no longer necessary. Congressional legislation in 1984 shifted the burden of proof back to defense attorneys who claimed that their clients were suffering from mental defects and judicial interpretations are still evolving. But the decisive turn in criminal justice was abandoning a straightforward standard for nebulous speculations the latter requiring vastly more knowledge than anyone possesses, as so often happens in the vision of the anointed. Despite much talk about science in discussions of psychiatric and psychological speculations, usually speculations about people who were never patients of those making sweeping statements about their mental condition as at the time of a crime that the speculators never witnessed, the key scientific procedure of empirical verification has been not merely lacking, but almost totally ignored, a psychiatrist or psychologist may testify hundreds of times as an expert witness in criminal cases without once being challenged as to the actual consequences of his previous testimony that turned criminals loose into the community. His expertise is never put to the crucial test of a record as to how often he has been wrong and at what cost in money, violence, or lives. As in so many other areas, the word science is used as a substitute for logic and evidence. In short, the essence of science is ignored in favor of its appearance. Many have claimed that the insanity defense is not a serious problem because it is used in only a fraction of criminal cases and used successfully in a smaller fraction. This understates its full impact as another factor delaying trials and providing grounds for appeals after conviction in an already overburdened court system. Moreover, the demoralization of the public as it sees horrible crimes go unpunished and violent criminals turned loose again in their midst because of psychiatrists' speculations is not a small consideration. Riots broke out in San Francisco after a multiple murderer was let off with a lenient sentence because of speculation that his eating Twinkies might have made him more excitable. But whether or not public outrage takes this form or some other forms, there are numerous signs of a loss of confidence in the courts and in the ability of the society to protect the public from criminals and other antisocial individuals who have become mascots of judges. It is not only psychiatric testimony which tempts judges into decisions which presuppose far more knowledge than anyone has ever possessed. Ordinary petty criminals have learned how to manipulate the arrogant gullibility of judges. A series in the Washington Post in 1994 included this vignette of one of many court appearances by a woman with a long history of petty crimes. 